Yle Podcast. Hello and welcome to All Points North, the Yle News podcast that aims to add a bit of climate awareness to your weekend activities. This week we'll discuss, uh, discuss Finland's reaction to yet another report calling for urgent action on climate change and possible measures for meeting the country's climate targets. Two guests join us today. Oti Hanpera, a lead climate solutions specialist with the government innovation agency Citra, and Hanna Aho, a climate justice expert from Kepa, and that's the umbrella organization for development assistance NGOs in Finland. This is the All Points North podcast, telling you everything you need to know about Finland this week. Hello again, everyone, and welcome. It's Friday and time for yet another episode of your favorite English language podcast, All Points North. It feels like we were here just yesterday, especially since my colleague Mark Odom is sitting across from me in his usual spot. Good to have you, Mark. Thanks, Denise. I actually haven't left this spot uh, since last week. That's how much I love being here. I can believe it. <laughs> Now, joining us this week is Auti Hanpera. As I said, she's one of the lead climate solutions specialists with the Finnish Innovation Fund, also known as Citra. Thanks for coming, Auti. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Great. And joining us in studio today is Hanna Aho. She's a climate justice expert with the global development NGO platform Kepa. Thanks for coming, Hanna. Thanks. Nice to be here. Excellent. Now, just so our listeners and so that we as well can understand where our guests are coming from, could you explain a little bit about your role as a lead climate solutions uh, specialist, OT? <laughs> yes. Um, so climate solution team Citra is a new team formed just uh, we started uh, at the beginning of May this year. And the aim is to to provide more information and solutions to to increase the ambition of, of the Finnish climate policy. So you're directly advising government, are you? We are providing uh, information and proposing solutions, yes, for the government. And we are then like after, you know, for example, after we publish a report or recommendation, we really hope to have a, a profound dialogue with the stakeholders to to discuss what this means and how this could be taken taken forward. Okay, so you talked about uh, having dialogue with stakeholders, which means that you're probably speaking with people like Hannah. Uh, <laughs> and it's a good point at which to bring you in, Hannah. What exactly does a climate just, justice expert do? Well, um, I'm an advocate for climate justice. So day-to-day life, I write blogs and talk to policymakers and try to tell them that, you know, climate change is really important. You should really do something that is actually would work and would help but also my role is to to tell about the lives of people in developing countries and how climate change is impacting them and how this problem is also a question of um, justice and and decent lives. Mm. Okay, so we're all a bit wiser and I'd like to ask you both to quite uh, quickly strip down this fresh report that was issued by the UN's climate agency, the IPCC, earlier this week, what you make of it. We know that the paper is calling uh, for uh, countries to slow global temperature rises by 1.5 degrees uh, down from, I think, what they say is currently, uh, in reality, a three to four degree increase. Uh, is there anything else that's striking about that report? Let's let's start with you, Oti. Uh, yes, I think the the key points are the kind of the difference between the the one point five degrees and the two, two degrees world. I think even you know the climate community who who are um, very aware and deep in these kind of reports and and scenarios were quite shocked about uh, the difference and the urgency to now to act and do something about it. And also, the kind of I, we have to stop the kind of the thinking that we can kind of pick and choose the the target that we are aiming at. We kind of uh, release the emissions, and then like according, we can we can choose the target. That's not the case. After the one point five degrees, the world becomes quite uncertain mm. and wild, and uh, we don't know how then the kind of the mechanisms will work. So after that, the you know, the risks are huge and we, we necessarily cannot choose anymore where we will 
end up. Thanks for that, Oti. And of course, when you mentioned two degrees, you're referring to the two degrees, uh, the two degree um, increase that was originally agreed in the Paris Climate Accord of a few years ago. Even you know, it wasn't two degrees. It was we we should aim well below two degrees and aim for 1.5 degrees. But I think I think there might have been a bit of kind of uh, misunderstanding, and people might have thought that actually two degrees is still quite okay. And now there is definitely new information that it's not and we should be much more ambitious and aim for max 1.5 degrees. Okay, I know Mark has some questions up his sleeve, but very quickly, let's go to Hannah to find out. Hannah, what's your takeaway from this latest report? Well, I think the main thing is that we know that two degrees is not the safe limit, as Odia as well said. But um, the impacts are also pretty striking when you look at two degrees or one point five degrees and um, for example to the biodiversity of the world or the poorest people in the world actually when we talk about 1.5 degrees we should remember that already at that limit we will lose most of the coral reefs of the world for example which is really devastating for many people whose livelihoods depend on fisheries Mm. actually hundreds of million people do especially in Asia. And then again, heat waves will become very extreme already then. So we also talk about uh, hundreds of million people who will um, will have to suffer those kind of heat waves. So in that sense, uh, we have to also remember that even if we are successful, which I hope we will be in limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees, it will be very important to make sure that we can adapt Mm. to already those dramatic changes. So the question is, because I think people may have this misconception that if we limit it to 1.5 degrees, everything's going to be okay. So you're saying there's still going to be dramatic changes in our environment and the way we live probably. Yes, exactly. And, And it will also happen here in Finland. So we will not be immune to the changes. And of course, this summer has already shown that already at one degree warming uh, globally, which which is two degrees in Finland, we are kind of, you know, Mm. it's double here in the north. Exactly. But already at that stage, we do see big changes in our environment and especially when we uh, how we produce food, for example. Okay. Um, So. After the report was released, we saw a flurry of re- reaction with experts like uh, Marku Ollikainen, the head of Finland's climate panel, saying that the country would have to slash f- uh, fossil fuel emissions by 100% or even 150 to meet the target. Uh, it sounds a little alarming to the average person. Um, we, I, obviously, you think there's a concern. Uh, what are the what are the impacts that that these kinds of uh, that global warming will have, even if it's at minimized? So I think it's important for people to understand that we still have a chance. So there is a message of hope, but we just need to act very very quickly. And globally, we need to be able to halve all our emissions in just about ten years. Mm-hmm. So it is very quick. But then again, the benefits will be huge. It will mean a safer world for us all. Um, In Finland, it is true, we both need to cut fossil fuel emissions and at the same time make sure that the the land that actually absorbs carbon, so our forests, our fresh waters, that they, they are protected and they are taken care of in a sustainable way, um, to make sure that we can actually reach these targets. But it will change our world, our everyday lives. And I know that it might seem worrying to many people, but I think um, there should... I, I hope that there is also some kind of a reassurance in people's mind that if we do this together, then this can also benefit us in many ways. Well... Uh, there's a lot more that we uh, we'd like to talk about, so but much uh, <laughs> so much more that we might we might have to reserve an hour for this. But let's just uh, jump over some of the issues that we wanted to address. Maybe we'll be able to come back to them a bit later on and talk with Oti a bit about some of the recommendations of uh, uh, initial recommendations that Citra is looking to propose, and uh, you'll have final recommendations sometime early next year. Yeah. So of course, this is a. There is not only one recommendation. This is a massive uh, challenge. And of course, there isn't just a single solution that we should uh, look at. And um, 
overall, um, Citra is, uh, for example, recommending um, a uh, system, sustainable uh, development budget planning, which means like a tax reform. So we should really shift our taxation on those things that we dislike, mm. <laughs> such as pollution, uh, over, um, over use of natural resources, produ- production of waste, and shift the taxation uh, to those and then uh, tax less on things that we like, which is labour. And, um, for example, we, we can also uh, reduce tax for uh, for businesses, mm-hmm. business tax. So it's really kind of like using all means to and all forces to drive the change. And uh, one key player in this field is is the government budget yeah. and how we, allo- how, uh, how we allocate funding and how we collect taxes. Now, if we sort of uh, break that down yeah. to a more granular level and maybe to a, to a level that people like, uh, uh, you know, Mark and I can understand, when you talk about shifting taxes to areas that we don't like, which is yeah. like fossil fuels, <laughs> if you, you know, indirect speak, are you talking about uh, taxation on fuel, for example, fossil fuels? It's a package, yes. So... Uh, in reality, we would like to promote uh, or enable a more kind of uh, fast, faster and uh, dramatic, uh, drastic change towards a clean, uh, low carbon world and also to promote circular economy. And uh, so in, in reality, it is either, yes, introducing new or increasing existing taxes on, on pollution waste and then but it's a package people always get very scared when they hear about oh new taxes you know increasing prices but at the same time you do, do this in a budget neutral way you reduce taxation on labor to 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 promote employment and also you can use taxes for example on business to 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 maintain competitiveness of the Finnish economy real quick i i uh, real quick i want to uh, ask about Forestry, it's a it's a big business here in Finland. Uh, there's a lot of trees here, and uh, it's green gold. I mean, financially, but it's also a major carbon sink, and they absorb lots of CO2 from the atmosphere. And last uh, this week, we reported about uh, a report from uh, in the Environmental Institute saying that uh, if Finland stopped logging. It wouldn't just be Finland wouldn't just be carbon neutral. It would become carbon positive. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be easier than taxing everybody? Uh, as I said, we, it doesn't eliminate that. Uh, we're not saying that that shouldn't, you know, happen. At the same time, we should protect is that, our. Protect is that our, part of the proposal? Or we haven't yet. Like um, this, uh, this particular piece of work that we will be working at and publishing, probably, hopefully, kind of uh, towards the start of the the new year. This will look at the the budget mm-hmm. reform, and then we will look at many other. You know, the team is providing many other solutions. To, to 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 kind of uh, at the end to have a more clear vision where we should aim at. But I this, see, sorry, I see that Hannah is bursting to say something <laughs> about this. So please go ahead, yes, Hannah. Thank you. I, I think there's a misconception often that if you do this thing, then you don't have to yeah. do the other. The reality is we need to do both. So <clears throat> with the taxations change and with uh, on, on top of cutting fossil fuel use, well, going zero there uh, eventually, we do need the forest. So uh, that is the the reality. You do need need the forest as an industry, you mean? Uh, We need forest standing. We need forest growing. Uh, We cannot increase logging into a level where our carbon sinks would be decreasing. That is the, the fact. Let's move the conversation uh, closer to the man and woman in the street. Uh, Ultimately, climate policies affect people like you and me, sometimes unevenly, as Hannah knows. And uh, I know that these are the kinds of issues that you work with in particular. Do you see any new changes in climate policy significantly impacting the lives of people here in Finland? 
I think that the big changes that we talk about are, of course, in our daily lives, in the way we we live, uh, in how big houses, how we heat them. Those are big decisions. The what kind of food you eat, um, going uh, towards more vegetable-based diet would be very, very helpful as well. And then, of course, do you take the train or the metro or do you need to take the car or can you for example, share it. So, of course, those are big changes. And, and cultural things, um, they can be difficult. But then again, a new mindset w- will help there. Um, and also here, as, as you said, that they're not like, we should do one thing and then all the other. Here, like, you know, there's a lot of responsibility on our kind of uh, choices. But then the government can help us to make these right choices by, for example... Ta- through t- taxation and the kind of relative price differences, so it's easier to choose yeah. a better or cleaner alternative. Sort of prodding people in the right yeah. direction. I got the feeling that, that Finland could maybe make some improvements, although there, I sort my trash or my, my recyclables, um, except for the plastic, that hasn't come to my neighborhood yet. Um, but in some cases, people have to sort their waste and then drive to a central point where they have to dispose of it you know, ecologically uh, and It's a bit contradictory mm-hmm. when you're taking the car out to take the the the, uh, the recycling, um, and but also there's no penalty for for not recycling. Um, yeah. Are there any measures that Finland's looking at to uh, address more recycling? In general level, the discussion about waste taxes, and that but that wouldn't kind of necessarily punish the the ordinary people or the ordinary man. But would, would would taxes reduce carbon limits, um, the, the level of carbon in the atmosphere? In general. Yeah, I mean, I mean, how how do we get people to, to recycle more? How do we get the country to recycle more? It's a it's a big kind of behavioral uh, change issue. There could be some some kind of incentives, but also, I think there is kind of also we need a a change in the way we think about like. This kind of, you know, the kind of more linear economy thinking, like I buy something, I I use it, and then I dispose it. Whereas if if we provide uh, more um, means to to promote the kind of more circular economy kind of thinking, then you don't only just think about oh, this is now waste and I recycle it, but it will become someone el- else uh, resource. And you know, if the incentives are in place, I do think that you know, if there are incentives for um, a, A price for incentives, for example, that someone could actually use that resource. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and Hannah, uh, you've you know a little bit about the outside world. Have you seen any measures taken where countries done really well with recycling? Um, well, recycling is not my real forte, I, but I would. Um, I think it's really important to to remember that. From little flows, there is a bigger piece, and and recycling is one of them. We are not that bad at recycling in Finland altogether, but we still have way to go. And and one problem is that we've started to, for example, burn quite a lot of our waste, and that is of course then in the atmosphere. So uh, I think the future will be actually mining from uh, kind of fields where there's rubbish so to say that that that, that becomes the gold mm. of of the future that you can actually do things out of the the stuff that we used to call rubbish yeah gonna, uh, yeah one day you're going to get some guy goes hey there's a big trash dump in my backyard we're rich <laughs> well actually you know things like gold or other valuable metals that is where you get them from right. and that is much more ecological than opening up mining pit somewhere mm-hmm. and polluting waterways. So yeah. that is just a new way of thinking, I think. I feel, uh, I feel yeah. I, like that that kind of industry is actually well developed in certain parts of the global south, if we yes. call it that. Yeah. But uh, they, they conjure up really disturbing pictures of kids mm-hmm. sort of clawing through uh, yeah. mountains of garbage yeah. To, yeah. to get the sort of materials that you would use in your fancy new smartphone, yeah. for example. Yeah. So uh, there needs to be, I guess, a, a sort of an ethical approach to, to yeah. that yes. kind of that. Exactly. Now, yeah. one of the issues that Can consumers I? yeah sure i just Sorry. want to add that it's, it's not only about recycling we need like a more um we need a bigger change for example in the legislation to enable us to use recycled materials sometimes the legislation just uh, such as health and safety 
measures they prevent us from from using recy- mm. recycled mm. materials. And can I just add uh, that? we also need to think how much do we actually consume. It's not that we recycle things that everything will be fine. We just need to lower the amount of stuff that we use in our everyday lives. Indeed. Well. I was going to come to the issue uh, to the issue of what uh, consumers have to deal with if we're talking about everyday uh, Jane, the everyday Jane and Joe. Um, and, and one of the issues I know certainly in my personal life I, f- I feel like I'm, I'm a bit frustrated with is Uh, the kind of waste that I, I'd rather not have. So, for example, retailers pushing a lot of plastic at me uh, in terms of, you know, lots of foodstuffs and different kinds of plastic packaging and so on. What about incentives on on that or measures on that end to maybe reduce that kind of uh, the amount of uh, material that's being used to present things that consumers have to buy, have to get food? There could be again ta- different kind of tax measures on on packaging that would hopefully provide incentives for those uh, for retailers, for example, to think how they package. We all know that if you order something online and it's just so frustrating how many <laughs> plastic <laughs> mm. wraps you need to open before you. Yeah. You get to them. Or just, I mean, ordinary items yeah. in the store. That, I mean, I think they're adult proof. Yeah. I can't get them open because there's so much plastic, so much hard plastic, yeah. and it's so. So I'm sure again, like you know, with the right incentives, we we can have ways to 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 guide the way we package our so, goods. So how how can Finland uh, modify, or not Finland, but how? I mean, how do you encourage people to re- to produce, reuse, recycle? Well, awareness raising is really important, I think. But um, I would also be very careful in saying, you know, people um, acting for for the climate should just concentrate on how they consume. What they actually should be doing is being um, being active in in the way that we actually decide on things in the society. So politically active in one way or another. At the moment, we have the problem that our policymakers, as you actually referred, are saying that climate change is a very serious matter. But then again, at the same time, uh, for example, our government is not really thinking about raising the the ambition bar uh, at all. And and this is where we need people. We need people actively saying we need a safer world. Uh, and and that this is a political push that needs to happen. Uh, so so you can act for climate change in very many different ways and and we are all you know we have different roles in our lives. We are fathers, we are children, we are someone's cousin and someone's friend. And I feel though that uh there's been so much talk about the need for climate change over the past maybe five years that people may have sort of stopped listening. And there is no urgency on the part of ordinary people to sort of change their habits or do things differently or even really engage in the kind of activism that you're talking about, pushing for pushing our politicians and pushing our uh, parliamentary representatives and so on to take action mm-hmm. and, and, and get things done. What what can be done about that issue? Well, I think us here talking about the the situation is of course a very important thing um i think there's quite a lot of movement at the moment like last summer kind of got people alert again if we have a winter when there is no snow that that usually brings pe- people get really worried about that as well so um i think kind of uh offering clear ways how to do things better helps quite a lot you know so You can do the recycling. You can stop flying, for example, and just you know, w- when you plan your next holiday, think about what kind of impacts that has. So, uh, I mean, but that hasn't happened, and I don't see it happening. So you don't think so? I, I know many people who already consider these things, but of course, we all live in our own bubbles. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, mm. yes, make uh, your bubble course, big, sure, bigger. Sure, you know, you, you know, a few people who who don't do it, or you know, who are very very diligent in in being ecological. But for the most part, uh, I'd, I'd probably there was probably more cars on the road now than ever. Uh, there's more airplanes in the sky, uh, more fuel, uh, etc. 
how come is it like a, a frog in a boiling pot that's slowly getting hotter and hotter and no one's noticing? Everyone's, well, that's, that's, we'll, we'll get out of the water when it gets too hot. And then it'll be too late. Um, that's why, you know, we have a government who needs to really push for policies that will, you know, take us to the kind of, right. to the end, to the goal, you know, to the end goal. And although we all uh, need to play a part, that won't take us there. We need, you know, government to... Has, to has the Finnish government uh, taken its own measures in, in transportation uh, when they go to meetings? Do they, do they take public transport? Or, or do they all, you know, do they try to reduce... Um... Some MPs use a lot of taxis. I've heard that. <laughs> well, now the, the the president has declared that his office will take this into consideration even more uh, than before and that they will... Reduce fo- their, their yes. carbon footprint by two-thirds, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. So that, that's just giving just an example to other people. But of course, the government's role, primary role, is to make it easy for ordinary people to do the good decisions, uh, the right decisions for our climate, but also for our environment as a whole. So we got we got government, we got the public. What about industry? How do you whip them into shape? The emission trading scheme. <laughs> That's the the main existing, uh, you know, measure that is. It's there, and we should make all like provide all possible measures to make sure that. The ETS, the emission, European Emission Trading Scheme, is working as efficiently as possible and makes it stringent to make sure that you know that will um, force the the indus- industrial sector to reduce emissions. Well, our podcast is all about our listeners, so it's only right that we bring their voices into the show. This week, our reporting on some of the proposals in that Citra paper we talked about er- earlier generated a lot of social media buzz. For example, Penny commented that a proposed fuel tax hike would unfairly punish people who don't live within easy reach of their jobs or even basic services and who don't have access to reliable public transportation. She said, many people outside Helsinki don't have an alternative. How would you respond to Penny's concern, either of you? It's a... It's a it's a just concern, uh, but I would like to remind that this we are talking about a package. Uh, it's easy to point uh, the, the tax increases and the kind of the implication that would have on ordinary people, but at the same time mentioned about um, reducing the labor taxes, and that should kind of help on the on the payday. You you will you will see it on your pay- payday. And in addition, this kind of package could include lump sum transfer for the more disadvantaged poor people, or in the lower, uh, more in the kind of lower uh, income decile, to make sure that if we shift from uh, from labor taxation to towards kind of um, taxing more natural resources and 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 pollution, that could kind of um, risk the uh, progressive nature of our taxation. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen, and we can, for example, uh, use these uh, lump sum transfers. And there is an international uh, experience that you know this kind of uh, measures have been put in place. Okay, now. Um Like you said, uh, people have a tendency to fixate on the things that they find frightening and and they think of as as very negative. So there was more commenting on this proposed fuel uh, tax hike. And uh, Amanda came at it from another angle. She said that increasing fuel taxes could have a knock-on effect on the prices of many products unless the transportation of goods is exempt from these taxes. Does your study... Will your study factor in that particular dimension? Uh, it's a it's a relevant uh, question. There might be some knock-on effects, and I hope I cannot say that we will be able to. But I hope we are able to then kind of model more kind of the the direct and indirect impacts of this uh, proposition and see what kind of then uh, safety measures should be in place to to kind of, for example, to uh, to prevent overall kind of massive price increases. But at the same time. We are talking about uh, kind of fuel increases in in today's world, 
but we don't want to live in this world for the rest of our lives. The aim is to really radically reduce the emissions from the transport sector. And then we need to take a step forward. And we are talking about uh, electrification of our transport system. And then hopefully then kind of fuel increases would play much uh, smaller role. I'm sure there will be a transition period mm. uh, before we are there, uh, but we will get there. <laughs> Let's hope. And uh, Din asked uh, on Facebook about the potential impact uh, these measures might have on small and medium enterprises, not just big industry. Hmm. Any thoughts on that? So imagine a small company that's relying on uh, transportation, for example. Maybe they're uh, delivering uh, things or, or maybe they're getting some of their inputs and they're having to pay higher fuel taxes and it's eating into their profits. They're a small business. It's something it's, that could it, make a difference. It's a good point. And maybe at the same time, if we are uh, thinking about the kind of poor households, we we could also look at the kind of uh, small smaller businesses and their, the, how they are impacted. I know that, for example, in, in uh, many UK cities, they're considering uh, putting um, rush hour charges on... Uh, to enter this, uh, the, mm-hmm. the city centre on rush hour at times. And, uh, Stockholm has that, correct? I'm not sure. I know that, I just know and that London, you can, London yeah. London does anyway. Yeah, anyway, yeah. And there was a lot of discussion how this would impact the smaller businesses and should they be exempt and, or... So there, the, you can always fine-tune. This mm. is just like an overall proposal, but you have to, it's, it's a good point. And of course, you have to think through the, um, the impacts carefully and, and make sure that this wouldn't kind of kill any 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 business as such but at the same time also hopefully in the near uh, somewhere in the near future also the um, the logistics and uh, the HGVs would also be uh, not just kind of diesel based uh, trucks but we can mm-hmm. then use gas or mm-hmm. electrification HGVs, also there yeah, yeah. M- meaning heavy goods vehicles. Exactly. Right. Very good. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, uh, isn't Tesla? There's there's some uh, uh, innovators testing yeah, are, um, electric trucks. And yeah, there is Volvo, like Volvo, Volvo just yeah. did one. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there are definitely yeah. yeah there's always there something new coming. Yeah. So we shouldn't just think that this, you know, about kind of situation at the moment, but really look at also where we are aiming at. Now, you made a point there about uh, thinking about impacts. I, Hannah is <laughs> <laughs> bursting, but talking about impacts. And I think that that brings us to the, to the next point. Uh, I'll just uh, talk a little bit first about some of the commenters, uh, so, or the comments rather, that some of our other uh, Facebook audience members offered up uh, on our page. For example, Stephen called for investments in the grid, meaning, I guess, the electric charging grid, and reducing taxes on smaller electric cars. And Huck proposed tax refunds for people who engage in car sharing, use biogas, or even just use it, their bikes. And uh, I'm missing a page there. But anyway, <laughs> the bottom line is that it seems to me that one of the things that policymakers have to do is to consider all the interdependencies in an economy, in a nation, in a society. So that if you, for example, you press one lever here, something happens over here and you need to be able to factor all of that in. H- how good of a job are we doing on that? I think Finland in general, uh, we could do much better in, in in evaluating. For example, if we put a policy measure in place, it would be quite useful to evaluate the impacts later and see if that policy measure achieved the targets that it was aiming at. And uh, if so, what was the key key implications, how, how those uh, impacts w- were achieved? Or at the same time, if we didn't achieve those targets, why? And we are not in very good in kind of systematically evaluating what we're doing. Mm. That speaks uh, to, to some extent to what you do, although you don't do it so much here in Finland, but in terms of li- looking at the impact of different kinds of policies on different groups. Um, well, yes and, and no. Uh, I think uh, what I take from this conversation as well is that we should be able to look a little bit further in the way that what kind of... Uh, society and economy do we actually have what kind of economic activity do we we want what kind of new businesses do we want and 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 the truth is that there are fields that are so so to say dying that the it's difficult to see a future for them but um 
And that, of course, brings concerns for many people. And that's why often we talk about just transition. Mm. So that when there are these big changes in the society, we need to make sure that we do shift from something that is disturbing our planet very fundamentally to something that is more sustainable, but at the same time take care of the people Mm. and make sure that there is a transition where you can learn a new new job, uh, get a new job, and where new businesses can arise in fields where we do need uh, need products or services and so forth. But, but at the same time, make sure that our footprint on the planet gets way, way smaller. One of those uh, uh, potential new industries that was talked about a lot uh, in the last few years was clean tech. And, mm. and, and I think it's one of uh, Finland's calling cards uh, in terms of the, the wider world that Finland is uh, doing extremely well in terms of the clean tech sector. What's, what's happening there? It's been very quiet lately. Have we actually been making ground in terms of covering ground or has Finland actually been covering ground in terms of building up these new possible business sectors that at the same time will uh, reduce emissions, help the country meet its its climate targets, create new jobs in, in new sectors? And be profitable. <laughs> yeah, don't don't forget the bottom line. It's quite difficult to kind of measure the change, and that's also something that we we hope to kind of look more uh, in detail. The kind of um, real, the kind of the potential of the of the opportunities in the clean tech, or more broadly, for the Finnish economy. Uh, we have expertise. I know, for example, in in the charging uh, for electric vehicles, and in many other. Uh, uh, sectors and technologies, but it is a fast-moving train already. And if we think about what is happening in China, how massively they are now producing electric vehicles or wind turbines, solar, it just the scale is is quite unbelievable. So we we really, if we want to kind of be part of take part of that cake, if I would say, and uh, in a way, one of the hopes of the IPCC report is that of course there is still time to to reach the one. 0.5 degrees, but it's also like the investments that are needed. Of course, you know we have to, you know, find that find the money and the investments. But then, you know, some sectors will benefit from those invest, investments, and we, of course, want to be part of that. Mm. So it requires quite, I think, a bit more work here internally to make sure that our companies are in in you know fit to mm. um, to compete. Yeah, real quick. Um, um, I, and I, I found your your uh, missing page, Thank Denise. <laughs> um, uh, and I would be amiss. Uh, I guess Isa, our friend on Facebook, would be upset to uh, to learn that we we would have forgotten his question about electric cars. Um, he he would like to see a more extensive charging grid because there's no place to charge them really. Um, uh, and, and I guess other questions like why doesn't Finland uh, make it perhaps uh, even more affordable to buy an electric car versus a, pe- um, a petroleum-fueled one. And I think Iso also talked about the fact that he would like to be able to charge his car in his apartment block yeah. uh, while he's at home. There's no such facility. He would like to be able to charge a car while he's at work. There's, a, no, such, there's no such facility. I think that's uh, clearly a pr- problem and, and that should be tackled. That's as simple as that. I mean, it's a good observation and that has been discussed already and, you know, government and he should we put should pressure do. and hope that all all of us would pr- put pressure in our workplaces in our kind of apartment blocks to kind of make sure that those charging uh, places are in place but I was also my understanding understanding is that our grid is still in in relatively kind of good shape considering the really low <laughs> share of the electric cars so cons- if you take into account the kind of the amount of electric cars we have at the moment, isn't, is it, isn't it a chicken and egg situation? Though, if the grid were bigger, people would buy more electric cars. But I think the, still, the, I the, think big, the grid is bigger because cars, yeah. I believe that the the issue is still the price. Mm. It's still you know you have to come to parity with the uh, internal combustion engine. You know when when people see that the the total cost when you include the kind of the capital cost and operational cost when they come into parity. I believe that people will, you know, go and buy them. So there is, and I think with taxation again, <laughs> uh, we can we can um, reduce the gap mm. ma- much faster. Okay, now we've got to move on. But before we we move on, uh, um, 
you know, we'll be essentially wrapping up the show. I would like uh, each of you to sort of, uh, you know, leave a parting message on this really, really weighty issue that, uh, you know, it really is in danger of blowing over. In, in a sense, you know, so you, sometimes you get a lot of hype around a particular subject. People get, you know, all breathless about it, but then they start thinking about other things. So if there's one important weighty message that you'd like to leave with people, what would it be? You go first, Hannah. Well, I think now is a good moment to get active on, on this issue because we have parliament elections com- coming up and also the euro elections coming up. So, you know, be active Talk to your your peers, your friends, your colleagues about the issue. Be active also politically and ask for for politicians to act on this. So we ha- you ha- we'll have a great chance uh, in one week, the twentieth. At 20th on Saturday, there will be a climate march in Helsinki, and we will have all of our leading politicians there telling what they are going to do about the situation. So come and and join us there. And at the same time, you know, if you own forest, keep it standing, (laughs) take care, good care of it. If you know uh, you're thinking about uh, buying a car, well, uh, consider what kind of and if you actually do need it or could share it, you know, do do little things and do uh, small things at the same time. Okay, what about you, Oti? Uh, I think it's a message about hope. We still have hope. We just have to make sure that the drastic changes that we'll need will happen. We need, of course, individuals. Uh, we, I think we all know what we need to do. So everyone should kind of do a little bit more, start kind of, you know, even uh, small changes will will matter. But then again, it's the pressure. Put the pressure on your local, um, uh, on your MPs, on your um, local Towards your, your local council, yes. uh, European, you know, members, your maps, and also, you know, the media. Make, we have to make sure that this discussion will it's not it will not die after this week. It will keep on going. I think media plays a huge role. Okay, well, we've got a lot of pressure on us as it is, but uh, <laughs> we'll bear that in mind. If you have something on your mind, send your comment or question to Ule News's Facebook or Twitter accounts or email us at yle.news at yle.fi. You can also send us an audio or text message on WhatsApp. Our number is plus 358-44-421-0909. We'd like to hear what's on your mind. Now it's time for us to take a look at some of the other stories that we covered this week. And we'll keep it short by just reviewing the news items that our audience engaged with most. First up, a photo of a rare white-furred bear cub taken by an inspiring young nature photographer gained widespread attention after being reprinted in several newspapers and shared like heck on social media. Upper secondary school graduate from the eastern city of Kuopio, Nilo Isotalo, snapped the photo at a nature reserve in Kuhmo, a region near the Russian border. Lovely. And uh, taxpayers can look forward to completely different tax cards next year as the tax administration Vero moves to streamline income tax reporting. In future, tax card will specify a set earnings limit for a full year rather than a monthly cap. Vero will also do away with a separate tax card for supplementary income and will apply a single tax rate to all your annual earnings. And finally, pupils in Finnish schools may get a free snack in addition to the hot lunches currently provided by municipalities. Agriculture and Forestry Minister Yari Leppä said he'd asked a team to look into the idea as a part of a push to improve school meals. The minister said that he was concerned by recent reports that up to 60% of students miss their school lunches. Hmm. Hungry kids. Yeah, and, you know, people said there was no such thing as a free lunch. They're getting a free lunch, but they're skipping it. Anyway, remember, you can find out more about what's in the news and maybe take a peek at that white bear cub on our website at wiley.fi forward slash news, or you can check him out on our Instagram page. Well, it feels like we only just started the show, but it's already time to wrap up. We can't say goodbye without talking about our weekend plans, though. Uh, For me, I can say that I'll be getting ready for my summer vacation, finally. Woohoo! And what a time of year it is to have. (laughs) 
What about you, Odi? I hope to enjoy the beautiful weather with my children and also play some football, my new activity. Fantastic. Women's team. Oh, congratulations. You go. What about Hanna? What are you looking forward to this weekend? Well, I still have a little bit of a cold, so I hope I will get rid of that. And otherwise I will do some yoga and uh, go hopefully for a walk in a forest. In the forest, of course. (laughs) And what about Mark? Well, I just might leave the studio this weekend and head out to the Superwood Festival by Ivana Helsinki. Uh, From Friday to Sunday, organizers promise 45 hours of music, art and food. It's all taking place under one roof at, Hel- at Eastern Helsinki's Hotel Rantapuisto, and it features performances by indie, rock, electro, and pop artists. Wow. So that's where I'm going. You're totally hip, Mark. So um, hip. Sounds like an inc- incomparable weekend for you, Painful as usual, hip. as usual. And on that note, I'd like to thank you all, especially our guests, uh, Oti Haranpä and Hanna Aho. Thanks for coming in, ladies. It was great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder now that uh, autumn vacation time is upon us all and we at All Points North will also be taking a break. But we'll be back in November. We can't leave without thanking our audience. Remember to keep in touch with us via our Facebook, Twitter and Instagram accounts and of course at wiley.fi forward slash news. This week's All Points North program was produced by Zina Iovino and our audio engineer was Jonathan Kottila. Thanks for joining us and remember to tune in again in November. Have a great weekend and have a great autumn. You've been listening to All Points North, a podcast produced by Ule News, a unit of the Finnish Broadcasting Company. For daily news from Finland in English, head to yle.fi slash news and follow us online at Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. You've been listening to Ule News.